Sorry, I have to go get a jacket. I'm going to get cold. <clears throat> Okay, here I am. There we go. Just waiting for people to turn up. Am I live? Yes, I am. Hello. Just waiting for everyone to turn up. Chaplets. This is really nice. Thayers. I don't know where I got it from. It's quite nice. I find the best is just plain old Vaseline. It's just awkward to use. Uh, okay. Um, what time is it? 6.45. Okay. Just waiting for everyone to turn up. I had a very busy day today. Some really good successes with clients, so that's always good. Okay. Ooh. Pardon me. Okay, I'm on YouTube. By the way, whenever I'm on a live, I'm on YouTube the whole time. So I bounce from Facebook to Instagram to TikTok, but I'm on YouTube the whole time. That's where I save all of my lives. I also save them on here on Facebook for 30 days. Um, yeah, and I don't save them anywhere else. So, okay, hello. Um, I got um, a lot of new followers today on here. So, if you're new, my name's Lisa. I'm a parenting coach. So I get the dishwasher going. Parenting coach, if you check out the link above, you can see my free behavior board, my mini toddler courses, my big boot camp course. I've still got those uh, group coaching sessions going, so it's not too late to get in on that. And then also you can look into coaching. I can't take everyone on these days because I'm super busy, uh, but you can send me an email. Tell me why you want to sign up for coaching, and then we'll go from there. Um, anyway, so feel free to start asking questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, also, I've got a funny story. I just told a client, and I haven't told it in a long time. It's a, uh, makes me look really goofy, but it's uh, it's a really funny story. I'll tell that later. I think uh, we'll see how we go. Anyway, okay. So let's get going with your parenting questions. I'm not usually on this late. Uh, I was. What's today? Monday. I was last night too. It was really weird. Um, I was on really late last night. So it's kind of nice when I come on later because it's not quite as busy. So it's a little bit less hectic. So it's better for you because I have more chance of getting to your question. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. So I just got an email from a client. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, never mind. <laughs> just always trying to work out appointments with clients. Okay, here we go. Can you talk a little bit about teenagers, behavior boards, and how to arrange consequences without completely alienating the teen? And yes, we've probably failed at being leaders. Don't worry about that. You're just going to learn learn better in the future. Okay, I'm going to read out to start with, uh, teenagers are my favorite age. That's what I specialize in. I started my business uh, doing teen crisis work, so they're right up my alley. Okay, these are my top three tips for parenting teenagers, and then we'll go from there. Uh, number one is you listen to understand and show empathy. You don't listen to gather information to lecture with, or they will shut you out. If they want your advice, they'll ask for it. Uh, the second one is negotiate pretty much everything. You can't negotiate. It's not a blanket statement. You can't negotiate everything, but it goes something like this. Hey, I want your dirty clothes in the hamper from now on. What do you want from me? You negotiate with the, with as much as possible. Um Never mind, I won't get it. I was going to talk about something else too. I got a million things to say about teenagers. Uh, and number three is don't sweat the small stuff. If they do something stupid and it's not a big deal, say, well, that was stupid. Do you want to hear what I did when I was your age? And laugh it off. It's okay to be human. It's okay to make mistakes just like you did, just like you do. It's okay. You don't want to shame them. You never want to shame kids for being naughty anyway. You just want to deal with bad behavior. You want to teach them about responsibility, to be responsible for what they do. It's not about shame. It's not about you were bad. You should never do that again. I don't. I would never talk like that. I just say, yeah, that was bad. Okay, here's the consequence. Now, do you want to go to the park? It's like that. It's quick. You never shame. There's, there should be no shame involved in consequences. Anyway, when I said, do you want to go to the park? I obviously wasn't talking about teenagers there, was I? <laughs> it's kind of stupid. I lost track of that. Anyway, so with teenagers... Um, when you're first said, okay, let's say if someone hires me uh, for teenagers, we never get to the root of the problem. Like we never address what the parents want in the first week or two. What we're doing is I'm learning a lot about you. It's all about you, right? Not your teenager. 
Um, and I'm learning all about you in that first week. And we always start small. And you on the behavior board, call it an accountability chart or a responsibility chart or a karma chart, whatever you want to call it. Don't call it a behavior board with a teenager. Well, you can, but anyway, it sounds a bit babyish. But anyway, so put down something really, really simple, like dirty clothes in the hamper and nowhere else, or um, dirty dishes in the dishwasher before you leave the kitchen. You always have to put like a, a condition on it. Like, you know why I said dirty clothes in the hamper and nowhere else? Uh, because if you say dirty clothes in the hamper, if you don't put a time limit on it or a condition on it, like in other words, they can't lay on the bed all day and then go in the hamper. So when I say nowhere else, it means that they have to go right off their body and into the hamper, that kind of stuff. So you start really small and with something that has never been a contentious issue. It just make it something really little and start from there. And then you might even say to them, what do you want my rule to be? They'll usually say, get off my back. And you say, ooh, that's too big of an ask right now. But anyway, so you get the idea. Work with it. you gotta, you got to bring them in on this. Give them a say in how things go. And I'm going to tell you a funny story. Not a funny story, but just what often happens with parents of teenagers. You know that dirty clothes go in hamper and nowhere else? A lot of teenage boys will take those dirty clothes with them everywhere all day. They won't put them anywhere else, so they haven't broken the rule. They'll take them in the car. They'll take them, sit in the house and watch TV with them. They'll sit at dinner with the dirty clothes in their hand, and they'll be eating like this, just looking at you. <laughs> I always warn parents of that. I say it might happen. They don't all do it, but amazing amount of teenage boys do that. Anyway, so then at dinner time, I wouldn't say a word all day. I pretend I didn't notice. I might try and use a little bit of humor and put a clothes peg on my nose if they were really smelly, but I wouldn't say anything. Anyway, so dinner time, they're sitting there eating with these filthy clothes in their hands. I would go like this. I would say, well played. Like, I respect that. I think that's funny. <laughs> so, I think it's great. Uh, I love teenagers. They're great. Uh, when you learn how to talk to them and how to relate to them uh, and how to respect them, they're actually fantastic. But yeah, uh, they're, a, they're a different level of parenting. You got to switch parenting. I haven't talked about this in a long time, but there are four very specific stages of parenting that you go through. Um, I'm going to read them out because if I don't, I'm going to go on and on and on about each one. So I'm going to try and keep it succinct. Four stages of parenting. Baby is zero to 15 months. That's when you're just meeting their needs and meeting their wants. You're not really doing much disciplining. You're just short, sort of saying no and then re-diverting their attention away from something bad. Then you go into the toddler stage, 16 to 35 months. This is when you're starting to correct bad behavior. You don't talk about it, though. You use consistent corrective actions. So if they hit something with a toy, you say no and put the toy away. So like take it away from them. So you're using consistent corrective actions. They're not going to learn the first 20 times, probably the, maybe the 50th time. Then you go into the child stage. This is the easiest one, three to 12. I know tweens are in there, nine to 12, but they're still sort of like kids. Anyway, so three to 12 years old, that's when you're at the height of your leadership. That is when all of their behavior is a direct result of your parenting. Okay, if you're a leader, they're, gonna, they're just going to want to please you because they feel great about themselves when they're around you. You don't want obedient soldiers. You want kids who make good choices, have high self-esteem, like themselves, and they kind of want to please you because you're the leader. You don't want a teenager to want to please you. You want them to please themselves. So then you go into the teen stage, 13 plus. You want them to be more their own leaders, okay? And you're there for backup for the big stuff. So those are the four stages of parenting. By the way, if you're new on here, I don't know what happened today. I got like 3,000 new followers just today. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened. So anyway, if you're new here, my name's Lisa, and I do lives pretty much every day. And um, I'm quite new on Facebook. I've only been on Facebook, I think, for about four or five months now. Um, but yeah, it's getting busy now. It used to be slower. So now it's getting busier. My lives across Facebook and um, Facebook, Instagram and TikTok are all really busy. YouTube is still my slowest one. So I, <laughs> I often forget to look at the questions just because it's so much slower. And plus, it's on my laptop. So it's down there. So what I do is when I'm transitioning from Facebook to the other ones or whatever, then I tend to read the Facebook questions. So I do look at them, but not while I'm scrolling uh, on the phone. So anyway, it's enough of that. Anyway, back to your questions. Oh, I'm going to tell you a funny story. Um, okay, this is just a funny story about me when I was a kid, but it's about connecting with your kids and how you include them in things and how my parents always made me feel really special, okay? And I, I like to think I, I know I did that with my kids too. So, and we had a little bit of different styles, but I'm going to tell you this really funny story. My mom, whenever she was baking, especially, I was always right in there like a dirty shirt. And we had like the kitchen table. It was like an alcove, like one of those, you know, like a, I don't know what you call it. Anyway, 
it was right up against the kitchen sink. So she would be passing stuff over for me. And I was really little, like four or five years old, and I had an easy bake oven. So whenever she was baking something, she would cut off little pieces of everything so I could bake my own little pies. So anyway, <laughs> by the time I was finished rolling out the dough, it was all black because I had dirty hands. It was just disgusting. Anyway, I was a kid. What did I know? So anyway, we'd be baking and chatting. And, you know, it's just all this bonding stuff, right? So my mom never talked down to me. She never baby talked with me. She always made me feel like I was like a friend or something. But I really respected my mom. I looked up to her. She was like, she was the leader in the house. Anyway, this is what would happen. I would bake this disgusting, awful pie that was like, it was just like metal, like wood. You could barely, it was just awful. And so, and she would bake this beautiful pie that was all crispy. <laughs> she was a really good baker. So my dad would come home and he'd say, oh, I smell someone's been baking. And I'm like this. And mom would say, yes, we have. And then he'd say, I have to try some of this pie. And he'd say to my mom, Lillian, your pie looks fantastic. And he'd take a bite out of it and he'd go, this is the best pie I've ever had in my whole life. You've outdone yourself. Then he said, then I said, try mine, Daddy, this disgusting, black, burnt, <laughs> horrible little pie. And he would try and take a bite. He'd try and gnaw, and I could hear him crunching it. And, and he's trying to look like it's good. And then he would finish, and he'd turn to my mother, and he'd say, Lillian, yours was good. But he said, I'm sorry, but Lisa just made, that's me, Lisa just made the best pie. It even outdid yours. <laughs> it was like this. I was all happy. That's how stupid I was. I knew it was crap, but I really thought my dad loved my pie. But anyway, you always want to be connecting with your kids, always making them feel good about themselves, okay? It's not just, and my, my parents didn't do, like, not a lot of praising, but just that kind of praising. You know what I mean? They always made me feel good about myself. So you don't tend to act out with people who make you feel that good, right? Connecting. It's so important. It's not just about discipline. It's about connecting with your children. Uh, ba 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 there we go. Uh, the staying calm and not repeating myself worked well with my 12-year-old grandson. Thank you. You're very welcome. I always say you just got to stay calm when you're disciplining. Discipline should be like a business transaction. You never get emotionally involved. Uh, you get emotionally involved when you're playing with your kids. But I always say that you stay calm during the storms and you can get crazy during the rainbows. The rainbows are the fun times. The storms are the when you're disciplining, right? It's like a business transaction. No emotions whatsoever. And then you also said, and not repeating yourself. Like I would never ask for something twice. If I said to kids, hey, look, we're going to be going soon, um, if they weren't ready, there would have been a consequence, or I just would have picked them up when they were little and carried them out to the car. I don't repeat myself. I said that twice, I know, but you get the gist. Okay. I can tell I've got new people on here. I can just tell. Okay. I. Yeah. If you're new here, my name's Lisa. I'm on here every day. I kind of get to know a lot of the regulars. Okay. How do you do media blackout with your child when you have to use technology as you work from home? Um, how do you do but Well, you have to use technology. I don't know what you mean by that. You have to use technology, but they don't. Do they? I don't quite know what you mean by that, Janelle. Okay. My kids are amazing. How do I get my wife to stop nagging and interrupting me? Oh, <laughs> very funny. <laughs> Maybe you need to be nagged and interrupted. <laughs> Sorry, I meant to say teenager. Teenager. Who is that? Uh, bu, 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 I'm going back. Okay, sorry. I had to scroll ahead because people come and go, so I only answer questions when I know you're still here. Like new. Okay, I got 3,000 new followers today. I don't know what happened. You know, sometimes you just do a reel or something that just takes off. I have no idea. I don't do my social media, so I don't have a clue what goes on. Um, I did do my, my big platform is TikTok and my second biggest is Instagram. I did my own TikTok, but I don't do the others. I got someone else doing all the, all of it now, but yeah, I don't know anything about this. I went on TikTok two years ago and blew up overnight. And it was funny because, um, someone kept saying to me, you got to get on TikTok. It's for you. Cause I hate, I don't like planning anything. I just like to turn up and talk. So, and they said, oh, TikTok's really casual. So I thought it was all 12 year olds dancing. I didn't know that like an old lady talking about parenting would take off. Like I had no idea. Uh, but yeah, so I started on there and then I, cause I didn't used to do much social media until two years ago. And then I think back in September, I started on Instagram and then I think November I started on Facebook. So, but yeah, I just really appreciate your support. It means a lot to me. Um, yeah, so social media is something that I'm kind of new at. 
I used to work, I've been doing my business for 17 years, but it was more ref, referrals, more old fashioned stuff, not so much the social media. Anyway, uh, I'm new and asked a question above. You have to ask again because I've just scrolled too many. I have to keep scrolling so that people are, I make sure they're here when I'm answering their question. Okay. Uh, please never stop posting. I've learned so much from you. Yeah, I really appreciate that because the reason why I keep, like these lives, I don't get paid for any of this stuff. I, I throw out a lot. Most of my content is just free. So I throw out all this free stuff all the time because you know, most people aren't going to buy my courses or hire me, right? So I want you to still get results. That's why I'm always here because this is wonderful. Imagine being able to help people every day. Like what a, what a gift, eh? Like for me, it just feels so good to be able to help people every single day. So I really appreciate you pointing out that when I do help you, I really appreciate you letting me know because it really does make my day. Otherwise, I wouldn't turn up here, to be honest. <laughs> if I wasn't helping people, why would I turn up? Um, I have, okay, I have three two-year-olds. We're foster parents. Okay, how do we teach good behavior to all of them at once? They don't understand. Okay, you got, okay. Two, okay, I'm going to read out my top five tips for parent three two-year-olds, and you're fostering three two-year-olds. Wow, you deserve a medal. That's a lot. Um, okay, I'm going to read out my top five tips for parenting toddlers, and hopefully this will help you. A lot of it is just management, managing their surroundings, etc. So these are my top five tips for parenting toddlers. Number one is you child-proof your home so you never have to say no. Number two is you set up a toy rotation system so they're never bored. Number And I've got a lot of videos on all this stuff. Uh, number three is you enter their world to connect with them. You don't connect with a two-year-old at the nail salon. You go to the park and roll down the hill with them. When you get good at entering their world, watch how they play and join in. When you get good at this, they just start to look at you differently. They're more likely to listen to you, okay? Number three is stop with the mini therapy sessions when you're disciplining a two-year-old. I don't actually do therapy sessions with any age, but especially with two-year-olds. They're not, toddlers are not about words. They're about actions. You use consistent, corrective actions because they learn through repetition. So they're not about words. You know, these mini therapy sessions discussing all their big emotions and big feelings. It's absolute garbage. That was invented to make the mom feel good. It has nothing to do with the toddler. Nothing. Okay, number five is stop trying to figure them out. Toddlers are not figure outable. They're brand new, fresh human beings. They've got one marble and some tumbleweed floating around in here. They're cute as a button, but they're just forming. I always call them crazy. They're not so much crazy. They just haven't developed sanity yet, right? They're just not there yet. Imagine if you've only been in the world for two years. In the first year, you were a potato laying on a mattress. Like they're just forming. They're, your expectations of toddlers are usually way out of whack. So just manage their environment. Give them a few toys at once to help them focus on that and then rotate them every week or whatever. So, and then childproof your house. Just make your life easier. And when you say something's going to happen, make it happen. Okay, we're going to change your diaper out now. No, no, change it anyway. Don't let them get away with stuff because if they start telling you what's going to happen, ooh, watch out. <laughs> So, yeah, when I said something was going to happen, I made it happen. The diaper might have been on their head. I mean, it was a mess if they were going through that stage, right? But it's still, I changed their diaper. If I said something was going to happen, I made it happen. So you say something and then you follow through with an action. Make it happen. So be careful what you say, in other words. Your social media is blowing up because you're wonderful and good news travels fast. Oh, thanks so much for that. Yeah, Facebook, who knew? You know, no one talks about Facebook anymore. But yeah, um, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's my fastest growing platform right now. Um, TikTok hit like 600,000 and then it just stopped there. It's really weird. I don't know why. But it, it, I was growing like 10, 10 to 30,000 a day on TikTok when I first went on. The first six months, I got 500,000 followers. And then it just sort of slows right down. Instagram's still good, but Facebook. I don't know anything about this, but it's quite interesting because I don't understand it. How does it even work? I don't know. Anyway, whatever. I don't try and figure it out. That's why I got someone else doing all this stuff. Okay, sorry, I'm scrolling because I don't. I want to make sure you're here when I answer, answer your question. Nine-year-old swears a lot, has ADHD and ODD. Oh, you're going to hate what I'm going to say. How do we stop the swearing? Get my free behavior board that's completely free. It's in the link above, and you put down no bad words in the... Um, in the rule as the rule so the behavior board has rules and consequences you're on that too okay that's what makes it work you have the whole family has to be accountable odd is oppositional defiant disorder it is not a thing it was just made up so that moms don't feel so bad that's what doctors have told me oppositional defiant disorder is not a medical diagnosis it just means you got a feisty kid that you can't handle that's all it means but parents parents don't tend to want to be responsible for their kids they want they want something to blame you know like oh it's because they got odd I would take full responsibility and say, i got to figure this out. 
you know, parents say, well, don't blame parents. Yeah, I am. I'm blaming you. If your kids are acting out, don't you want the blame? Don't you want the responsibility? Take the responsibility for how your kids act. If you don't, you'll never improve it. Okay, never. So take full responsibility. I used to work with tons of kids, teenagers, delinquent teenagers, difficult kids. And I always took responsibility for their behavior when I was with them. If they acted out under my care, I always went like this. What am I doing wrong here? What am I missing? I took responsibility for others, other people's kids that I saw for one hour a week. Take responsibility for your children's behavior. It's the only way, right? Someone wrote to me when I said that. They said, oh, way to shame parents. And I said, no, I'm blaming. I'm not shaming. You want to be blamed for this, don't you? Would you rather blame your kids? They're little. They're innocent. They're just victims of us, right? They're just victims of you. If they're acting out, it's, they're just victims of your parenting. That's the way I always looked at it. I thought, if my kids act out, oh, well, they're just victims of me. So, you know, you, you take full responsibility for how they act. Between the ages of 3 and 12, that's what my boot camp course is, 3 to 12 years old. It's all about you and your leadership. You lead, they will follow. It's a natural instinct for a child to want a leader. It just is. If you're not a leader for your children at home, you send them out in the world, they're going to be very vulnerable. They're going to be very impressionable and very vulnerable. They're going to be susceptible to peer pressure, bullying, the drug dealer on the corner, the internet, the Kardashians. They're going to be very vulnerable out there in the world if they don't have a leader at home. So be a leader. You become a safe place to land. You're the one who makes them feel good about themselves. You increase their self-esteem. You guide them into making good choices. Take full responsibility for their behavior. Between the ages of 3 and 12, that is your responsibility. Um, teenagers are a little bit different. They're more influenced by other people. But they're still, they're still pretty darn good. But what I mean is between the ages of 3 and 12, you have total control over their behavior. You just don't know it yet. But yeah. Their behavior is a direct result of your parenting between the ages of three and 12. Under three, they're nuts anyway. And then teenagers can go a little bit astray. They kind of test things out a little bit more. But they're still going to sort of stay in line because they respect you, right? And when they respect you, they respect themselves. Daughters turning three will use the behavior board. What are some things you typically see needing to be worked on around that age? Oh, a lot of hitting, a lot of um, don't want to sit at the table and eat. Uh, a lot of bedtime battles. Um, yeah. Tantrums aren't a behavior, though. You never put anything there. Tantrums are not a behavior. Tantrums are a loss of emotional control at not getting their own way. They're not behavior. Um, yeah. No, I won't mention that. I just got an email from someone today. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, never mind. Um Anyway, yeah, tantrums are not something that you punish. You don't talk about them before, during, or after. There's absolutely no point. Um, they're just a loss of emotional control. You don't really need to discuss that. Yeah. Where you put your energy, where you put your focus is what grows. If you're putting your energy and your focus into tantrums and bad behavior, it'll just get worse and worse and worse. Pretty much guaranteed. Yeah. You put your energy and focus into the good kid, not the bad behavior. Bad behavior, you, get, you deal with it like that. Anyway, I'm going to tell my pool story because I know I've got a bunch of new people on here today. A whole bunch of new people joined up on Facebook today, so I'm assuming i got some new people in the live. I'm going to tell the pool story. I don't tell it very often because, you know, I've told it millions of times. And it's in the video. I think it's the first video in my page. I know it is in Instagram and um, a a TikTok. I did that myself. I pinned it. It's the very first video. It's called Example of Leadership Parenting. It's my best story for this, uh, what, how I teach leadership parenting. And it's the best story to explain my whole theory on this and why it works. Okay. Um, anyway, true story. My son was eight years old and we had a pool party for his birthday. So we invited five little boys over. So there were six eight-year-old boys in the pool. My husband took our daughter somewhere for a while. And it was just me counting six heads in the pool. So anyway, we had this giant blow-up toy. It was called Whaley. And it was giant. Now, I, I didn't want to take the air out because we didn't have a foot pump. So, and these kids were eight. They weren't three. So I said, okay, now Whaley is way over there because I don't want him going in the pool because I can't see behind him. So three of you kids could drown. I wouldn't even know it. So Whaley's a safety hazard. He has to stay over there. Sure enough, one of the kids brought Whaley in the pool. So I said to him, I said, Whaley, out of the pool now. And I pointed to where Whaley had been. And he said to me, no. My son went like this. Because he knew I know how to take care of business and he was going to enjoy the show. <laughs> so fully clothed, I'm in the pool like a shot. 
And I took this kid and I brought him out and I sat him down beside me and I said, you're going to sit here for 10 minutes. My son got Whaley out of the pool and now I'm counting five heads in the pool and this is what I'm doing with this kid. I said to him, I saw you at soccer the other day. Didn't you get a goal? High five. Way to go. And remember we worked, I used to work with him. I used to do all this stuff at school. So I said to him, oh, and we worked on that test the other day. I hear you got 85 out of 100. Way to go. Excellent. And what's your favorite PlayStation game? Well, he's having a blast. He's telling me, 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 and another thing about me that makes me wonderful, blah, blah, blah. He's talking, talking, talking. So <clears throat> anyway, the 10 minutes is up. So I said, okay, 10 minutes is up. Go back in the pool and have fun. I couldn't get rid of him. He's talking, 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 having a blast, having, chatting, chatting, chatting. So I kept looking over at my son like, <laughs> so finally he got him back in the pool because they were going to be playing basketball or something. They needed two teams of three. So anyway, finally goes back in the pool. He was all over me all afternoon. Lisa, can I help you with the cake? Can I help? I couldn't get rid of him. Three hours felt like three weeks. I mean, he was just all over me. And also when he went back in the pool, he was telling the other boys, don't get Whaley in the pool. He shouldn't do that. Now, why, why did that all work so well? What did I do? I don't let anything go, by the way. I don't take any crap from kids. Uh, I had said to them before they even got in the pool, Whaley cannot go in the pool. Now, when he brought Whaley in the pool, I did not say, can you please take Whaley out of the pool? I'm not going to beg him. He already knew he did something wrong, so I'm very direct. And it was a safety issue. He broke a safety rule. So I pointed and I said, Whaley out of the pool now. And when he said no to me, I would never repeat myself. I'm in the pool. I take action. I get him out and I very clear, clearly state, you're going to sit here for 10 minutes. Why would I not tell him why? Because he already knows. I don't go on about the bad stuff. I don't go on about the negative. He already knows. In those 10 minutes, all I'm doing is bonding with him. All I'm doing is making him feel good about himself. That's all. That's my whole focus is for him to like himself when he's with me. Now, when they like themselves when they're with you, how do they tend to treat you? Beautifully. And then at the end of the 10 minutes, if I had said to him, okay, 10 minutes is up, <clears throat> time to go back in the pool. Don't take Whaley in the pool again. I would have erased all the good work I just did. Like, you know what I, You know what you're saying to a kid if you say that? Remember how rotten you are. Remember the bad kid? Remember that kid? That's what you'd be doing. It's mean. I just said, okay, go back in the pool, have fun. It's all positive now. Don't hold grudges. Don't have them in the doghouse. Don't remind them of bad stuff. You focus on the good kid. You deal with bad behavior, but you focus on the good kid. 99.9% .9 of everything I did with kids was in connecting with them, bonding with them, making them feel good about themselves when they're with me. I don't, I don't take any crap though either. So, and they like themselves when they're with me. How much power do you think you've got when you've got a kid whose self-esteem is skyrocketing when they're with you? It's gold. It's all, it's kind of like magic. It just works perfectly. Okay. Anyway, um, that was the pool story. And I'm going to go now and I'm going to be going over to Instagram. If you want to join me over there, I'm also on YouTube the whole time. And, um, what was I going to say? Oh, that's it. Anyway. Oh yeah. Check out the, uh, the link above. Everything I have is in the link above my free behavior board, my mini toddler courses, my big boot camp course. I've still got the group coaching sessions going on with that. So you can still get in on that or you can look into coaching. I can't take everyone on these days. I'm super busy, but you can send me an email. If you want us, if you want to get in on coaching, tell me the age of your kids and what your challenges are, what you want to work on. Anyway, thanks so much for joining me. Happy parenting. Okay, YouTube. Uh, my daughter has developed a little fear around sharing her injuries with me. Is there anything you have to suggest? She said, I have no idea what you mean by that. It's on YouTube. I have no idea what you mean by that. On sharing her injuries with me. What do you mean by that? I don't know what you mean. Uh, okay, another say, case says, tips for diaper changing when baby is constantly turning herself around. Just do it anyway. you got to do it as fast as possible. It's a stage they're going to go through. My kids both went through that, so they didn't want to have their diaper changed. Sorry, I'm answering YouTube here. Um, they didn't want to have their diapers changed. So they did the crocodile turning, you know, how they spin around and all that. So I just I just held them down and did as quick as possible. Um, their dad, on the other hand, would try and barter with them. How if I give you a toy? And of course, they got worse and worse and worse. Whereas I just made it at, you know, whenever they're little and they're learned, they're trying something out. I just sort of make sure that whatever I need to do, I, I get it done. They might have been, you know, having a fit or whatever, but that's OK. Didn't last very long with me. 
because uh, they know when I say something's going to happen, I make it happen. Their diaper might have been on just on one leg and on an arm by the time I got it on them, but I made sure it got on them. Okay, what else now? I'm just looking at YouTube here. Found me on TikTok. Excellent. Yeah, I've been on TikTok now for two years. Oh, the yeah, the story, the pool story. That's my best story. Um, I've got another one that's just as good, but it's about teenagers and it's a little bit more intense. I only tell that in coaching because uh, it's a bit, you know, teenagers are another level. They're my favorite age though. Okay. Uh, let me see. Now I'm back on, I'm on Instagram now, by the way, if you're new here, my name's Lisa, I'm a parenting coach. If you look at the link above, you can get my free behavior board, my mini toddler courses, um, my boot camp course. I still have that group coaching session every Saturday going with that. So you can still get in on that. Um, and then coaching. I'm really busy these days. I can't always take uh, new people on. Uh, but if you're interested in coaching, look it up first. If you really want to sign up for coaching, let me know the ages of your kids and what you want to, uh, what problems you want to solve. Okay. Do you have any tips for potty training tricks? Yeah, I do. I have a whole course on that. It's one of my mini courses and it's the toddler one. It's called potty party. I trained my, my kids were both two and a half because I wanted to wait till I knew I could train them fast. I didn't want to drag it out. So anyway, I trained my son in one day and my daughter in two days, no pull-ups and no night diapers. It, it goes into how you do that. It's a whole party, but I was already kind of a leader before I did it. So it was, it's easier when you're already kind of a leader. Um, but yeah, it's a good way to start uh, start exercising your leadership sk skills too, because you want to be fun with toddlers and potty training is all, it's all positive. It's all kind of fun, messy, but fun. You'll see. Anyway, check that out if you're interested. It's a whole system. Anyway, I'll tell you a funny story. Years ago, I used to do a lot of TV. So I'd turn up as the parenting expert. You know how they, you know, they bring you in to answer questions, whatever. <laughs> I had, uh, I was going to be talking about potty training and on the, st on the stage, on the set of this, it was breakfast TV here in Vancouver. They had a toilet all set up <laughs> and I thought, great. My sidekick, like how classy am I? My sidekick is a toilet. It just struck me as so funny. But anyway, as soon as I saw that, I thought, geez, you're classy broad, Lisa. <laughs> Who do you go on TV with? A toilet. And I'm talking about pee and poop. Yep. Can I trust a three-year-old telling me his teacher hurt him? What should I do? Well, I don't know if he's a liar or not. You know, I mean, I kind of want to look into that. But what I would do is only three. Okay. I would say, so what happened? And take notes. So what happened? And then she did that. And then you did that. And what did she say? What did she do? And then an hour later, ask him to tell you the exact same story again. Now, he, if they're lying, they usually change things. The truth never changes. So, but if you're really concerned, you're going to want to look into that anyway. But yeah, that's what I would do. Interview him. Write it all down. The truth never changes. But lies change a lot, especially with a three-year-old. It's harder to catch a 12-year-old in a lie. It's easy to catch a three-year-old in a lie. Oh, they might tweak and change a few things, but the actual facts of the story never change. Okay, sorry, I'm scrolling ahead because I like to make people or I like to make sure people are still here when I'm answering their questions. Um, How to correct a child who doesn't want to wear shoes outside their home. Well, are they two or 12? I don't know. It makes a big difference. Potty talk. Is it a big deal? How to encourage them to have less voice five. Ten. Oh yeah. Just say no bad words. I would put that on the behavior board. I, I wouldn't want them doing that. Uh, so put no bad words on the behavior board. And there's a consequence if they say a bad word. Simple. Keep it simple. It's hard to do, but it's a very simple. What I teach is very simple. You know, you're, you're teaching them how to make good choices in life. That's it. You're on that behavior board too. It's rules and consequences for everybody. I would never use a behavior board. It's a teaching tool. Um, I invented that 16 years ago. I started my business 17 years ago. And the first year was, you know, I was learning, but I was sort of teaching what I did. That's not how you teach. You don't teach where you are. You teach where you were and how you get there, right? So then I figured it out. I thought, ah, oh, behavior board, put the parents on it too. Because I, I was very accountable. If I messed up, I was accountable. I made amends to my kids. They got to punish me if I made a mistake too. So, you know, like you've got to be accountable because you're a leader is accountable. A dictator is not. Uh, the old-fashioned authority style parent would never be on a behavior board, uh, but a leader would be because I wanted my kids to see that I'm accountable too. Anyway, uh, I invented that behavior board 16 years ago. Changed. I've never changed it in 16 years. It's just a rule and a consequence for everybody and uh, one per week. So you got three of them. 
Uh, you never go past three. It gets ridiculous after that. It's just a teaching tool for you to learn how to do this stuff. Then you do uh, the in-the-moment discipline after that. Check out the boot camp course. It teaches you how to do this in five weeks. Um, so you do three weeks of the behavior board. Then the next, then four, week four is in-the-moment discipline. And week five is more of in the moment discipline so you've already learned how to discipline having a rule of consequence but you don't need you don't need the board anymore um yeah i would never use a board because it's like a triangle the kid the board you i want the kid and me that's it so but i'm level 10 with what i teach but when you're learning that board is a big support system it's like let's go to the board because you're not really sure what you're doing yet but you get it helps you to get organized Oh, you got a three-year-old. Uh, yeah, I don't like. I don't like animals hurt. Animals getting hurt by kids. I, if it was that bad and you can't control it, just say no going near the dog for a while. And if they do, you, there's a consequence. So yeah, I would rehome an animal. If I couldn't control a kid from harming an animal, I would rehome the animal. I would for sure. Uh, we had a house full of animals. My kids knew you do not harm an animal. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm an animal lover. There's no way I would allow that. No, a lot of advice on how to stop doing something, but not how to get her to do something. That's because no one's asked you. If you want them to do something, say, follow chore chart, follow bedtime routine, follow mealtime routine, follow school morning routine. And if they don't, there's a consequence. That's how you do it. Put it as the rule. You have to do this. Put your dishes in the sink after you eat. That's the rule. If they don't do it, there's a consequence. Look it up. It's on the behavior board. So, yeah. Easy. It's 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 simple, but it's hard to do if you're not used to doing it. Okay, when you add bedtime routine to the behavior board, follow bedtime routine. Um, uh, there's two ways of doing bedtime routine. You can have a consequence for not following it the next day, but usually the consequence it depends. Uh, it's kind of involved, but. I do have a bedtime battles course if you're interested, two to eight years old, and it explains how you do it. It doesn't go on the behavior board. It's just a battle within itself. Um, but the other ones do. The, the school morning routine does, mealtime routine does. Bedtime, it's a battle enough. They don't need a consequence. <laughs> Unless it was just the getting ready for bed, then you might want to put that. All bedtime routine, if they don't uh, the next morning, um, you might want to have a consequence. You can do it either way. But you'll see if you check out that bedtime battle, that bedtime battles course, you'll see what I mean. Um, it's usually a night of hell. Um, yeah, it's how to get them to bed. That's the easy part. How to keep them there? You just keep putting them back in bed. You don't say a word. You don't talk to them. You don't look at them. Just keep putting them back in bed. Putting them back. It can go on for hours. So it's, it's one hell of a night. Um, I had one family. Um, I think they're the funniest. And uh, they decided to have a bottle of wine when they were doing this because I told them it's going to be hell. They had an older kid. It wasn't like a toddler. It was like a um, seven or eight, six or seven-year-old. I can't remember. Years ago. Anyway, um, and they decided to have a bottle of wine while they were doing this because they knew it was going to be a rough night. Do it on a weekend. And um, anyway, the kid went till five in the morning. Mom stopped drinking and dad kept going. He had two more bottles of wine. He got so blotto he couldn't even walk. And mom had to take over. This kid went till five in the morning. Because it was just a battle. I said, you have to win this. And you win this battle, there won't be as many other battles either. Because it was a big one with this kid. Anyway, uh, the kid never got up again. That uh, was the only night that kid kept getting out of bed. And they had to keep putting him back, putting him back. And all they did, the mom said, all I heard was him swearing out about Lisa, about me. <laughs> I hate Lisa. I'm going to kill her next time I talk to her. And, uh, and then he was banging off the walls. And then she had to take over. But yeah, it's an awful night. How to deal with a seven-year-old answering back. They're answering back because you're not a leader. When they respect you, they don't do that. You've got to work on yourself. Work on your leadership skills. It happens organically. They never talk back to a leader. They'd be embarrassed to do so because they want to please you, especially at that age. So, yeah, that's just a tell. It means they don't respect you. So you can't say, you respect me. That's what you're expecting. If you, ex if you don't have their respect, you can't just ask for it. You can't just demand it. You have to command it. You have to work for it. You have to earn it. I've worked with hundreds of kids. Troubled teenagers, everything. I work my butt off to get respect. So you got to earn that. You haven't earned it. That's why they're answering back. We don't respect you. Check out my boot camp. My boot camp course teaches you how to be a leader in five weeks. I tried ignoring it. Ignoring what? 
uh, I can't go back. I get dizzy when I have to scroll back. If you put a whole question in one, one spot, it, uh, I'll answer it. What would be an appropriate consequence for potty talk? It's just keep it simple. The consequence doesn't matter. Uh, like don't get caught up in worrying about what's on the board so much. They put down no bad words. And then if they do, they have to do a chore within 15 minutes of being asked to do so. So it could just be washing a window. Don't make the chore 15 minutes long. Make it like a five minute long chore, but say it has to be done within 15 minutes of you asking them to do it. And if it's not, then you go to the second consequence. You'll see. There's always two consequences for kids. There's a positive action. That's the one you start with. If they don't do it, then you do the negative deprivation, like 24 hour media blackout or something like that. You take something away. It's funny, the, the parents who, in coaching, I would say the parents who have the fastest results and the quickest success is they remove all emotions when they're disciplining. I keep telling them that. There's no room for emotions in discipline. Uh, remove all of your emotions. It's like a business transaction. Treat discipline like a business transaction. And then when you're, you got to play with your kids too. That's on the board too, usually with parents. Um, you have to play with your kids a lot. So you connect with them. So, but yeah, there's no room for emotions when you're disciplining. Like if a kid's acting out with me, I would say, um, hey, that was bad. Here's your consequence. And then like, it's just that quick. And then I'd say, okay, do you want to go read a book or something? Uh, can we get a list of consequence? You don't need it. I've got, check out the behavior board. That's all you need. It's, and each home is so different. You can come up with a chore, wash a window, sweep one floor, like one, one room, um, do some dusting, you know, for 15 minutes, clean up 10 toys in 10 minutes. Don't say clean toys for 10 minutes. They might just put one toy away. So say put away 10 toys within 10 minutes, something like that. Make it measurable uh, with time or amount of what they're doing or both. Well, you don't need a list of consequences. What chores are there around the house that a child could do? I don't know why. I don't want to do a list of consequences because it's so different with all the families. Um, yeah, you, you know your house. You know your household. Put shoes in cubby. Like sort out the front room, um, you know. Yeah, I get asked this all, this, all the time. Does that start a bad association of helping around the house and chores? Who cares? Chores aren't supposed to be fun. Why do you care about that? Like, why do people worry about that? I don't understand that. Well, then they won't like chores. They don't probably not going to like them anyway. Who cares if they don't worry about that. Don't try to make everything fun. Uh, that's a big mistake. That's the please your parents tell. It's okay if they have a bad association with chores. That's actually good. You want your children to learn how they, they got to do what they need to do before they can do what they want to do. You want children to, learn how to do things they don't like. That's okay. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, what time is it? Oh, I've got to move over to TikTok now. If you want to join me over there, it's Bratbusters Parenting. If not, check out the link above. You can get my free behavior board, my mini toddler courses, my big boot camp course. That's how to get respect in five weeks, three to 12 years old. Or you can look into coaching. I can't take everyone on these days. My schedule is pretty packed. Um, but you can look into it. If you really want to hire me for coaching, let me know the ages of your kids and what challenges you have. Okay. I'm moving over to TikTok now. I'm on YouTube the whole time. So thanks so much for joining me. Happy parenting. keep playing with my hair, but it's itching my neck. <sighs> I've got very coarse hair and it's not comfortable up against my skin. It's like wire. Okay. I could probably tie some uh, plastic bags with it, you know, twist ties. Okay. Just waiting for people to turn. I like to take a bit of a break sometimes with my voice too. It's hard just talking at people for an hour, for an hour and a half. Hello, people. I don't know how many of you are new. If you're regulars, um, you can start asking questions anytime. You said it's so hard. Thank you for doing this. You mean parenting? 
Yeah, parenting is the hardest job in the world with the least amount of training, and yet everyone expects you to be an expert, especially you. It's just ignorant. Why on earth would you expect to know what you're doing if you've never raised a family before? Like, I just hate that. They say, it should just come naturally. Why? It's just so ridiculous. Why should, it's the hardest job in the world with the least amount of training. And yet everyone expects you to be an expert. But 100 years ago, parenting did come naturally. For one thing, they didn't expect some, as much from themselves. Kids were, we were all out in the streets. I wasn't, a, I'm not 100, but you know what I mean. We, it wasn't as high maintenance as it is now. Our parents were not driving us around everywhere. And we were expected to go out and entertain ourselves. So it wasn't as demanding. Um, also, um, like let's say 100 years ago, there was a village raising kids. You know, even in my day, I was born in 1960. And back then, there was we were all running up and down the streets all the time, and all the moms knew all the kids. And they thought nothing of tattling on all the kids. Hey, Lillian, you're so-and-so. You know, like they're all tell, they all they all had each other's phone numbers. And so we had a whole village raising kids. So if parents were struggling with something, they had the whole village to talk to. Now everyone's very isolated and very judgmental. No one was trying to be a great parent back then either. No one cared about it. Yeah, the kids are a pain. We're, you know, I'll get them off to bed early, then we can have a drink. <laughs> They just weren't expecting as much of themselves. Now there's so much pressure on parents. I don't know. I don't know why. Anyway, okay. And mostly it's you putting it on yourself. Uh, thoughts on changing bedtimes as consequence? No, bedtime should be consistent. I don't fool with meals or, or food or bedtime. I don't tend to use those as consequences. Never. No. No. That's sort of in the the needs category. You don't mess with the needs. They need to go to bed. They need to eat. You don't tend to mess with the needs. Eight-year-old coming to our bed, even when I put him back every night, he tries the next night. Well, you just got to keep putting him back. Like, I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense to me. Like, if you keep putting, you must let him stay in bed for a while then. If you instantly walk him back into his own room, he will eventually stop doing it. So it doesn't that doesn't make sense to me. Why would he do that unless there's a reward? At eight years old, they only do what works past the age of four. At eight years old, there's got to be a reward for getting out of bed and going into your bed. You must have let him stay there before or now even. So, yeah, there's, I'm not getting the whole picture there because it doesn't make sense otherwise. <laughs> um, I remember once this, uh, someone said, three-year-old always telling everyone he doesn't like them. I would just ignore it. Um, <laughs> actually, what I would say is, oh, they probably don't like you either. <laughs> like, I just would throw it right back at him. Anyway, years ago, um, this little kid, this little snotty kid that came over to our house, and he says, I don't like your dog. I should get, you should get rid of him. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to keep the dog and get rid of you. He, no one had ever talked to him like that before. He was a real little handful. And he was like, oh, she said to get rid of me. And I, just, I didn't care. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I do tell him that grandparents are sensitive. Ugh, I wouldn't worry about other people. They're your kids. Do you have a picky eater, eating course? I never will, and I'll tell you why. I'm not a nutritionist or a doctor, and that sort of eating is like a medical thing almost. So, but I'll tell you what I did with my kids, okay? But it's not for everybody. I'm a bit radical. Um, I'm very into health food. We had no junk food in the house. So my kids knew if they didn't eat the healthy stuff, uh, the only option was to have healthy stuff. There was no potato chips or ice cream waiting in our, in our pantry or freezer. So, and also... I, by the way, I hate cooking, but I made everything from scratch because uh, I'm really into healthy stuff. So I made everything from scratch and I was very good at pureeing really healthy stuff, ingredients and throwing it into everything. Like my cakes and muffins were very different from other people's cakes and muffins and cookies. They were so full of wheat germ and seeds and all, all sorts of stuff. I would throw everything in there. So, um, but yeah, I got really good at that. Like I would mash up cauliflower and put it in cheese sauce and I was very good at all that stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah, 
I don't really talk about it though, because not everyone wants to do that either. They want to have an ice cream, ice cream or whatever in the freezer. But my kids knew there was none of that in the house. So, yeah. Okay, how do we correct 17 month old from hitting and pushing other kids? They need co consistent corrective action and they're not going to learn right away. You just have to watch. If you've got an aggressive kid, you have to watch them like a hawk. It's not fair for other kids to be get hit and pushed around. Remember years ago, uh, my son, I had to stop seeing this mom actually. She had this little boy that was all, her little kid was always beating up my kid and they were like one, one and a half. And he was just pounding my son. I, I just would run over to it. And she'd say to her little boy after he finished hitting my kid, Say you're sorry, and he'd go, sorry, and then he'd just do it again, do it. He never stopped. So I would I would have physically picked him up and taken him home if I were her, but she just never knew how to handle him. He was a very aggressive child. and um, But, yeah, she never really dealt with it, and she never took his toys. But whatever he was hitting with, she never took it away. See, I would have taken that away. There was no consequence. He never learned his lesson. Anyway, they moved off. Um, I had to stop seeing her because there's no way I'd put my kid through that. But, anyway, um, she just wasn't handling him. So anyway, year, uh, they moved away, and I hadn't seen her in years and years and years. And it was I was talking to someone at the gym, and they were telling me this story about this kid in school. And they said, the worst bully they'd ever heard of. And they said, he's been kicked out of every high school. I knew right away it was him. I hadn't seen him since he was a baby. And I knew right away it was him. I said, is his name? And they said, how did you know? And I said, yeah, I knew him when he was a baby. Uh, she never did correct him. So, yeah, that's your job to interfere and not allow that to happen in future. You're just going to have to watch them like a hawk. It's a temporary stage. They'll get over it, okay? But for now, you're just going to have to be diligent and just make sure he can't attack other people because um, it'll become a habit. And getting a kid to say sorry and then nothing else, what's the point? Like, doggy. He actually likes saying it, doggy. And then, <laughs> then he pound again. A uh, three-year-old doesn't let me away from her sight. She has the biggest tantrum. Um, is that a problem? Like tantrums are them processing, not getting what they want. So it's okay that they have a tantrum, you know, like everyone's afraid of a tantrum like this, but that behind every tantrum is a lesson. If, so long as you're dealing with them properly, like you have to ignore tantrums, you ignore the crazy and reward the calm. So while they're having a tantrum, I'd be filing my nails. As soon as they stop, Oh, y'all done. You want to read a book? But yeah, you never give any attention to a tantrum. Attention is tantrum food. If you're talking to them or looking at them during a tantrum, you're fertilizing it. It'll grow in intensity, frequency, and duration. Uh, yeah, you just ignore ignore the tantrum. It's not bad behavior. It's a lack of emotional control and not getting your own way. I don't let anyone come in on my lives. Um, I did it once years ago, and they just talked about their business, trying to sell to my audience. <laughs> Never allowed that ever again. I couldn't get rid of them fast enough. It's funny. Well, I was new. I didn't know what I was doing, so I let someone come in. Um, how should I respond to my five-year-old when he says he hates me? Well, they usually say it when they're mad, right? So I would just go, whatever. Absolutely what I would do. If he says it when you're all happy and laughing and all that, then I might look into it. But if he's just saying it because he's mad because he didn't get his own way, I literally would just go, whatever. And then just go back to my own business. Like, in other words, you want him to know that you heard it, but that means nothing to me. It's just manipulation. Just manipulation. Okay, I'm going to read out. Um, you know, I mean, we talk a lot about discipline here because I'm responding to you. Coaching is nothing like this. Coaching is completely, I'm, I control the whole thing. And it's all about getting you into a leader, leadership position. Just talking about discipline is a tiny, tiny, tiny part of parenting. Most of it is connecting with your children, playing with them. You know, their love language is fun. It's play. Their love language is not discipline or discussing all their emotions and all that stuff. That's ridiculous. Their love language is play. It's fun. Um, yeah, connecting with your kids is everything. You play with your kids in their world. Play in their world, not your world. Play in their world. You'll just see a difference. Connect with them. I'm going to read my top three leadership qualities because I teach leadership parenting. That's what I call it. I just, I coined that phrase. By the way, watch out. If you're going to 
Uh, if you're going to go searching for me, not saying you're going to, but if you do, just look at the look at my uh, link above. Do not go doing a general Google search unless you know for sure it's Bratbusters Parenting because there's a whole bunch of people out there scamming parents out of money. They use my videos, my name, all my information, and they scam people out of money. I can't control that. There's scammers all around the world doing stuff like this. But yeah, watch out. The link above, if I'm talking here, the link above, that is me and all my stuff is in there. Um, but yeah, watch that. Every day, pretty much, someone sends me an email telling me they've been scammed out of money by people pretending to be me. Um, I'm not bratbusters.net. I'm not bratbusters.ca. I am bratbusters.com, and it's bratbusters, plural. So, but yeah, they've pretty much copied my website, and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, okay, these are my top three leadership qualities. Number one is you stay calm during the storms. That's the discipline. The storm is the discipline or the tantrum, whatever. Stay calm. Number two is you be crazy during the rainbows. That's the happy times. Play with your kids. Get goofy. Get fun. Get giggly. Get silly. Okay? Play in their world. And number three is be a great listener. Uh, you listen to understand, show empathy. You don't listen to gather information to lecture with. Be a really good listener. Be a safe place to land. Don't listen with judgment. Judgment, And don't listen and then give, okay, here's what you should do. Like my mother, if I went to my mom with a problem from a very young age, I would say, mommy, what should I do? And she goes, well, I don't know. You're a smart girl. You can figure it out. And then we talk about it. I always thought I was figuring out my own problems. She was empowering me. She was making me a strong person. And uh, yeah, I did that with my kids too. Yeah, I never really told them what to do. I'd say, well, I don't know. Let's figure it out. And they usually came up with better ideas than I did. Okay, um, I'm going to get going now. I've got still some work to do tonight. So anyway, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate the support. It means a lot to me. And, um, you know, I do these lives pretty much every day. I don't always have time to do them. I would say five, six days a week I'm doing a live. And uh, tomorrow is my regularly scheduled one. That is at 4.30 my time, Pacific time. Thursday night, same thing, 4.30 Pacific time. All other days, I never know when I'm going to turn up. So I just turn up when I've got time. Anyway, thanks so much for joining me. Happy parenting. Good night.